we're going to open today with a conversation that really that looks towards the future of, of uh, uh, our industry. Um, technologies uh, like robotics, automation, artificial intelligence, crypto, the metaverse, right? these are all fundamentally changing uh, society as we know it. Um, they're impacting all of our critical infrastructures, climate, energy supply, financial systems. These are uh, truly transformative capabilities. I think the question that we in this room need to ask ourselves is, have we learned from recent history in terms of how technology can uh, introduce risk to society? Um, uh, and how are we mitigating those risks, right? Are we doing a good enough job? Uh, and this session is gonna explore some of those themes. So we have a truly uh, esteemed panel of experts joining us today. Uh, we have, starting from my left, uh, Mark Kuhn, the Principal Deputy CIO for Cyber at DOD. We then have Chris Derusha, the Federal uh, CIO at uh, OMB. We then have Dave DeWalt, uh, the founding, uh, founder and managing director of Night Dragon. Uh, and then we have Craig Abood, the president of CareSoft Technologies. So, gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. I think I'm going to throw this out uh, in terms of starting the conversation. Um, many of you either lead directly or, excuse me, lead directly or work with some of the largest organizations in the world. Um, what emerging technology trends do you think and do you see as being um, probably the most impactful to society over the next decade? I feel like we're stuck in the corner over here. I, like, I, I, wanna, I wanna come closer <laughs> to everybody. First of all, thank you for, for having us. And um, oh my God, it's great to have everybody here. I'll just say, I heard somebody say earlier, like we're off to Zoom and Teams a little bit. So I almost wanna do a group hug for a minute and just like everybody, <laughs> have everybody around. But um, I just wanna also say thanks to the panelists. We've had a, a great chance to chat in the back too. But um, I'll just say, what's the big trends for a second? Um, you know, it's amazing watching what's been happening in the last 30 days, 45 days. I think everybody is uh, paying quite close attention to what's all been going on. But, you know, at least for me, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch. Um, you know, first of all, it's just I'm so proud to be an American for a second and just say, like, here we are all uniting in a way that is really elevating our defenses and working together in ways we maybe never did before. But from a trend point of view, you know, things that keep you up at night right now is, you know, is, is uh, on one side, and then the other side is the incredible atmosphere we're in right now. You know, I call it almost the golden age of cyber in a, in a positive way because we've seen so much um, investment going into cyber. I mean, last year, $29.3 billion go into the cyber market, right? That's twice as much as we saw the prior year. Right, we've, we've seen an incredible amount of companies emerging, almost 7,000 cyber companies now in the world. Many of them are just started up in the last two years. And we've had this incredible atmosphere of response to the threat that's gone on. And then on the other side, we have the most elevated threat environment we've ever seen. I mean, the most zero days, the most ransomware attacks, we have this Russian-Ukrainian environment going on, we have supply chain issues, crypto security problems, you know, space, cyber coming together. I mean, there's this industrial problems that are happening. So it's an incredible time to, to be in this domain of cyber. And I, I know, Craig, you um, one of the biggest uh, uh, participants in cyber as well, as well as our, you know, Chris as well. And uh, I'll just say it's an honor to be a part of all this. It's incredible. Anyway, I could probably talk for four hours, so watch out. <laughs> so you guys go. <laughs> Yeah, what else, guys? What are some of the other uh, um, emerging technology trends that you think are really shaping maybe the sectors and, and the organizations you work with? I mean, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's obvious that everything's becoming connected faster, and uh, that is creating all sorts of risks that we're working to get a handle on. And, you know, as Dave was just talking about, you, you look at the situation here uh, in the geopolitical events, and we, we now have a uh, event that's occurring overseas that we have to really be concerned about here in the U.S. And you see us in the administration um, being very proactive and engaging this community and others in ensuring that everybody understands those risks and is prepared for them because in each of these events we now have to look at um, kind of capability and intent. And certainly in this case there's capability. And, you know, we just know that uh, unfortunately because of how pervasive the technology has become in interconnectivity and, and the lack of, I would say, still mature understanding around the, the risks that presents just means that um, we need everybody to be prepared right now because we're kind of looking at a lot of different potential uh, impacts and eventualities, right? And so I think that's just the huge trend. I mean, you can go into all the different trends like cloud and quantum and all the things, but everything's just 
moving faster, higher compute power on both sides of offense and defense is just leading towards um, more serious consequences that we're starting to uh, have to really you know, spend time preparing for. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, one of the things I want to emphasize, and we had a good, good discussion about this this morning, is the education in cyber. Uh, as, as a deputy of the cybersecurity organization, just because that cyber's name doesn't make, make it automatically ours, it's a collective responsibility between those operating the business IT systems and in, in the case of the department, the weapon system, right? They, just because it's a weapon system doesn't mean it's not cyber. So it's, it's everybody's responsibility to go look at cyber holistically. Just as we uh, lock our doors and, and close our windows at night, cyber is something from a lexicon standpoint where we've probably made it too hard. But let's make that more mainstream, more, more part of our day jobs, everybody's day job as, as part of the thinking going forward. Uh, given the fact we have five million or so shortage of cyber people in our place, we probably have a lot of people doing cyber who are, do, think they're doing cyber. And let's edge, and bring that more into the mainstream, more into their, their line of thought where maybe that's not their 100% of their job, but it's part of their job and, and cyber responsibility. So I think cyber education going forward uh, is the part of the next, uh, next decade is something important. My daughter's a school teacher in Florida and, and again, talk about how, we, how do we start early. Well, who educates the, the kids the most? It's the parents. So if the parents are cyber literate, the kids will become cyber literate. So I think we have a multi-generational uh, problem, but we also have a multi-generational answer. Uh, my, my dad, who's in his 80s, he's understanding how to work an iPad, can, can teach that to his grandkids. So I think there's a way, uh, combination, yeah, we are a little bit behind, but I think we do have the wherewithal to go do this, and I think this current, current situation we are will uh, help highlight that. Yeah, and, and these are interesting points, and the, the session, this session is titled Preparing for a Sustainable Future. And so as you're thinking about all these technologies and capabilities that you guys have just mentioned, um, what are some specific concerns that you have from a security, privacy, maybe ethical perspective? You know, we always, uh, years ago when I was first getting started, uh, Ron Ross, who everyone knows, kind of a, a, a talk said something about, you know, we rush to adopt technology without thinking about the, the, and doing due diligence on the consequences, right? So as you're thinking about all the technology that we're adopting, uh, automation, you talked about space, Dave. I mean, what are some of the things that, frankly, concern you that we're not paying attention to right now that could have adverse consequences in the future? Greg, what do you think? You want to start? Well, you know, so <laughs> we, we represent and support a lot of emerging technology companies in the market. And one of the VC companies that we work with appeared at Dave's company a few years ago, asked us, uh, came in and asked us to support one of our vendors. And he talked about the huge increase in VC dollars going in. And I asked him, hey, when does this stop? When do we hit the threshold of we've got enough cyber security companies? And you, you, your question of, you know, what's the, what's the concern, the next concern? And his, his answer was, Craig, twofold. It, the cyber technology investments that we're making aren't going aren't gonna to slow down for two reasons. One is that the bad guys, once we figure out a hole and we patch a hole, the bad guys, they're not, oh, well, let's go do something else for our lives. Let's go become dentists. No, they have to go find the next way to go penetrate, penetrate systems. But his other reason for why this cyber business is continuing to go up is sort of your, your question around um, the, the threats that are concerning is, Sid, but every year we're inventing new places to apply technology and put technology out into, and all those places are going to need to be cyber secured. And so the concerns that, that I'm seeing is all the new technology that's going out there and, hey, the, the ability, they're, they're all going to have their own vulnerabilities that we don't know about yet, yet today. Yeah, I hate to age us because collectively we might have like, a, you know, 100 years of cyber experience up on the stage here, some pretty amazing number. But, you know, I'm really lucky, like Craig, we kind of grew up in this, this cyber domain, you know, almost 20 years for me. I was the CEO of McAfee and then Mandiant and FireEye. And I'm lucky now to have this big venture platform called Night Dragon where I get to see a lot of different companies and different problem areas. But, you know, it's amazing. In 20 years, I've used this term called the perfect storm. For those who've ever seen me speak, I've literally used this, this analogy of this perfect storm all the way back since like the, the turn of this century. And the perfect storm is this inertia of technology that we keep adopting and how fast that inertia is that creates this wake of vulnerabilities 
which creates these opportunities for the attackers, which creates this atmosphere, this perfect storm, to enable us to have these threat environments that we have. And then when exacerbated by geopolitical tensions and anonymity on the internet, you have this constant storm over 20 years. And here we are as we go into the next 20 years, what's changed? Like, unfortunately, not much. And if anything, we now have 100 nation states with offensive capabilities. We have over 800 actors we have to track. We've got new types of threats that are going on. So, you know, a little bit ominous from, from that point of view. But at the same time, you know, again, I'm really encouraged. Um, you know, I just can't even tell you watching our administration today, and I appreciate the gentlemen that are up here like you have no idea. Um, you know, Jen Easterly and Newberger, Chris Inglis, you know, hearing the president talk about cyber and, you know, directives from the top like he is, national cyber education programs, countries working together, you know, this is what we need to really try to slow down that storm and really, uh, you know, end up in a place that's a, a little bit better than we've, we've been before. So, you know, I just encourage everybody, the, the more we can work together, it takes a village in this game. To, to kind of solve the problems. I'm sure some of you have seen, you know, yesterday there was a pretty big announcement of the Hydra marketplace being taken down. Uh, if you guys didn't read that, take a read on Hydra. You gotta have good cyber words like Hydra, right? You know, but here's a dark net marketplace taken down that was in operation for seven years. You know, one of the most prolific uh, environments that was very hard to get at and all hidden behind a Tor network, very difficult Russian operators. But during the last 30 days, we've been able to bring it down. We also, through the Conti leaks, were able to bring down one of the major ransomware operators in the last 30 days. And watching the collusion together around governments and our own government is really incredible, I think. So, guys, thank you for, for all the work you do. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, what I'd add to that is, you know, to your point, we've been really focused on resilient design. Um, if you look at all the things the administration's been doing over the past year, you can look at the Infrastructure and Jobs Act that came out. Not only do we have uh, money specifically towards cybersecurity spending in there, but we're, we're focused on ensuring that all of that infrastructure money um, is, is, you know, that we have requirements in there that are going to come back with resilient design, right? And, and that's important. If you look at the executive order 14028, we have, uh, I think you mentioned in, in the opening there, uh, some requirements for secure software development. So that when government buys software, we're going to ensure that uh, you know, the vendors are, are following NIST's new secure software development framework, for example. Also, you look at the IoT uh, labeling. I mean, that's an educational effort, but also is, in, is, is a design to try to incent more secure development of, of IoT products. So you can look throughout. It is definitely a theme, and I think that's, that's the kind of long-term play and approach is that we just really have to focus on ensuring everything is, is built with security in mind from the yeah. beginning. Um, many of you mentioned, and of course, we, we knew this would come up today as the, the, uh, um, this tragedy you know, unfolding before our eyes in Ukraine. Um, but it really begs the question of how technology has fundamentally changed geopolitics um, and our you know, response to um, our nation state adversaries. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, how do you think technology is really changing? And maybe we can start with the, some of the, the, the public sector folks. Um, uh, how do you think technology is changing the way that we as a nation are uh, responding and engaging to some of these um, uh, incidents that are going on across the world? And because of technology, are they now hitting closer to home? I'll give, give it, and let's, uh, let's bring up the, the current geopolitical situation. How many wartime leaders get to talk to Congress talk to the British Parliament, get to talk to world leaders, get to talk to the United Nations from his really? wartime capital. That wouldn't happen. Maybe you saw Baghdad bomb 20 years ago from, from Iraq, but from really the impact of what President Zelensky is having uh, with, with the war and, and uh, the efforts going on, I think that, that's a primary reason probably where we're galvanized, at least where we started out that way, as opposed to uh, with, uh, with where we've ended up. But with the technology that everybody has, all the cell phones, all the sensors, all the things out there, makes it harder to hide things that have gone on. Uh, so we're able to have more accurate accounting of what's gone on and, and better, better feel from day-to-day -day actions and, and just, uh, better intelligence as a whole across, uh, across this whole platform. So I think the technology in, set, in this case is a good thing where it's actually helped us and helped galvanize the effort uh, to, to, to fight back. 
Yeah, I mean, so, so I think I mentioned this in the beginning too, right? Anytime we now have a conflict like this, we're gonna have to really assess capability and intent. Um, and in this case, we've made our assessment and you've seen what the administration's uh, said a lot on this. Um, so I won't restate what my, my colleagues um, have, have said, but you know, we've been really focused on ensuring preparedness because we do believe that it's a, there are real risks now. And I don't think, you know, if you go back to a case like 15, 20 years ago, you know, I don't think we had those levels of concern at that point. Um, and, and now we do, and they're real, right? Which is why you see the administration taking it so seriously and ensuring everybody's got all the information that we have. Um, and so I, I think that is a new state of affairs. And I don't think that it may necessarily be as high of a level of threat in every single scenario, situation. Again, we're gonna have to assess each situation and each capability and intent as we go. But we know what this one is and you know, are acting accordingly. So. Yeah, I think you're, you're bringing up a great point, Chris. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the virtues I've been espousing of late, I call it, I call it uh, future fusion. So just bear with me for two seconds. Future fusion is a learning that I think we just had in the last 30, 60 days. And what is future fusion? Fusion is how do we begin to bring together, like in the words of the government, combatant combatants, like the COCOMs together. How do we begin to think about space and cyber, supply chain and cyber, industrial and cyber, you know, air, sea, every, all the domains need to be fused together in a way that gives us a lens to the bigger threat problem that's occurring. So one of the things we've watched, you know, thus far, and I'm knocking wood a little bit on my knee here, but you know, one of the things we haven't seen from Russia's efforts is an integrated COCOM. We've watched a lot of dysfunction between their cyber command, their space commands, their air commands, their land commands thus far. What have we watched from the Allies' point of view? A highly integrated command. If you take that to enterprises, over time, we're gonna to have to integrate a lot more. Physical threats, cyber threats, supply chain threats are real, and they all have to work together in order to solve a bigger risk problem that's occurring, because all the, the cyber ubiquity that's occurring is gonna to touch everything that we have. Many of you probably saw a number of the satellite intrusions that were occurring, particularly Viasat and Starlink. These are cyber attacks on space infrastructure. And we have to start to work together in all areas of combatant commands to work and solve some of these problems, in my opinion. So coming out of this crisis, what are we gonna learn? How to integrate that. Our chief security officer and our chief information security officer have to work together. Our supply chain officer has to work together with both of them. And it all has to come together in a way that I think we're gonna solve the future threat problem that's occurring. Anyway, what do you think, Greg? Um, I'm going to leave all the geopolitical stuff to. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the the comments that you made, you know, it, it, and we talked about this in the breakfast we had earlier this morning. Uh, it seems like some of the solutions to this, um, uh, and really all the challenges, is really increased stakeholder engagement. You talk about the different communities. We talked about community in, in the opening remarks. Uh, those communities that need to come together to solve these problems. Uh, how do you see, um, you know, within the the organizations that you're working with, different stakeholder groups? coming together uh, to um, not, hopefully not just respond, but proactively address and, and, and fix the systemic issues that are kind of creating these vulnerable states. W what are you seeing, uh, and, and are we heading in the right direction? Uh, and um, do, do, you know, do, you have any, do you have any examples of what maybe your organizations are doing uh, uh, in that vein? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that one. One of the things, uh, obviously with the Department of Defense, we have our, uh, business IT systems, we do our day-to-day -day work, but the big part is the weapon systems and, and the acquisition thereof. So that's a big partnership with us, with ANS, our Acquisition and Sustainment Organization, to get after the cyber vulnerabilities, not over, only in the existing systems, but the new systems as they're, as they're coming out. So I think from a policy slash operational standpoint, that's a big change in, in culture with the administration and, and the leadership at the Pentagon is getting after the cybersecurity vulnerabilities and, and weapon systems, and then to follow on that, all the critical infrastructures that parts of the Department of Defense, uh, making sure all the, all the controls and like the executive orders and the, and the National Security Memorandum, not only do they apply to our business systems, but they apply to the whole of the DOD infrastructure 
that has any part of cyber to it. So that's a culture change with the side of the department that we're working with our policy or principal cyber advisor team and the acquisition and sustainment arm. So I think that's a team, team sport we're all engaged in from the Department of Defense level. Yeah, I mean, the executive order tasks us to develop a lot of new policy and our theme there has been trying to do that in collaboration with industry. So we've had, um, you know, even extend, or broken the rules a little bit on our deadlines in the EO to make space for a public comment on new policy or engagement as we just did with the secure software development. Uh, in a public workshop, and we, we need the feedback. Um, we, we need to build this together, and we won't get it right if we don't. And we do see that, and we're trying to make sure that we do that in every case. But also then, you look on the operational side, I think um, DHS CESA is doing a fantastic job. They have the JCDC now, the Joint Cyber Defense Center, and uh, there's real time collaboration, info sharing going on around current events, but just even before that. Um, when it stood up around Log4j, there was a lot of information being shared. And then go up higher to the strategic level, you look at the Cyber uh, Safety Review Board, I sit on, on that as a member, and it's a public-private board. This was also directed in the executive order, and we are, are as our first review, or we're looking at the Log4j event to try to suss out, hey, what are the root cause issues here? Um, you know, these open source vulnerability events, when they happen, are a really big deal. What can we do, what should we be doing collectively as a community? to make sure that this, this either you know, doesn't happen again or when it does, that our response is as optimal as it can be. And it's probably more the latter for now, right? Um, these things will keep happening. I think you to that too, Dave. So you know, there's, there's collaboration going on, sort of public-private collaboration throughout, and that's the theme, and it, it, you know, we're fully committed to ensuring that it continues. Think about what you're both saying for a second, right? This, this whole notion of the developer and the supply chain taking center stage has to happen, right? Because secure software development starts with developers thinking, I got to harden my code. I got to make sure I build in security controls from the day I write the code. But what's also incredibly important is, well, what is your supply chain of software for weapon systems or for integrated componentry? Where does it come from? Who's touching it along the way? How could it be tampered with? So if you don't understand your supply chain, you don't understand how to code more securely, you're never gonna really catch up to the security problem, in my opinion. So, you know, what can we start to do as a community to you know, get a mindset of shifting left, which is the term for the developer taking stage? How do we get a mindset that supply chain has to be a control point for every company's development. If you don't have supply chain understanding and visibility to every component that goes into your product, you're creating a risk for your product. So if you don't understand that first level, second level, third level, it's incredible. One of our companies, Interos, uh, the founders here, put together a report that said, here's all of the Russian-Ukrainian interlock to America. That report is like a no shit moment. Like, sorry, but it's like, you just realize how much development, how much supply chain interaction we have with, say, Russia or with Ukraine. And how safe is that code? How, in, how secure is that? So if we're ever gonna really get at this problem, man, shifting left, securing software development, understanding supply chain, man, it's right at the, right at the core. But you know, Dave, there are, there are a couple examples where we, we, are, we do have progress doing some stuff, right? And if I'll, I'll pick on the FedRAMP program for a second, right? It's been around 10 years, but it's done two, it's done two things. And we, we're selling billions of dollars a year of FedRAMP solutions in the public sector, and it gave everybody a, a single set of controls. And hey, guys, you go meet those controls, and you can repurpose your, make, re, make this stuff re, reusable and repurposable but it also pushed some of that work back onto industry to go, hey guys, go get your platforms and your systems more secure. And the common stuff with CMMC, CMMC should be, we should be two or three years ahead of where we are today with CMMC and the, the software supply chain assurance programs that are just now coming out um, in the wake of some of the stuff that happened uh, last year. Um, hey guys, give industry a formula that they can go repeat and, and execute on, and I think they'll do it for you. Yeah, and as you guys were talking, it seems like we were talking about incentives, right? Who's incentivized to do the right thing, to embed security into the dev process, 
Uh, and that goes back to our conversation about stakeholder engagement because uh, ultimately, a lot of these decisions are made at the boardroom you know, level, right? Regardless of uh, who your boardroom is, if you're public or private sector. And I think um, uh, it really goes to underscore the importance of setting and aligning incentives, whether it's through policy, I think, I think Chris mentioned policy, um, or, or um, earning government contracts through CMMC, uh, or hopefully just doing the right thing, because we want to ensure that we're building more resilient systems to uh, improve and, and protect our national security. Um, uh, believe it or not, we're kind of running down to the last couple minutes here. I think we have about four or five minutes left. Um, I was watching 60 Minutes over the weekend, and there was a quote that said, um, if you think technology can solve your security problems, then you don't understand problems. Uh, you don't understand the problem, and you don't understand technology, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, and I think it kind of pivots to what we're talking about with regards to uh, there's the technology layer, but so much of what we're trying to accomplish will not be resolved unless we get the right people involved and get the right leadership involved. So just in closing, some closing thoughts, you know, what are some of the non-technical components to the challenges we face, and how are you seeing that we're overcoming them? We talked about better collaboration, but what are some of the non-technical um, you know, priorities that you guys have that you think would help us move, move, uh, move forward and, and move left? I mean, I'm not shy, so I'll start, but you know, I think of two things. You know, I think of literacy. Right, you know, we need to elevate the cyber literacy in this country and the world. Right, it has to happen. Right, where does a lot of the breaches start with? Is lack of literacy in the cyber domain. Oh, I clicked on something that caused an infection, or I misconfigured something. You know, literacy has to rise. America's university systems and the world's university systems. You know, we call it K through gray. I love that term, kindergarten through gray education. How do we begin to rise literacy? Because the more literate we all are, the less vulnerable we're gonna be. My opinion, that's one. Number two, you know, can you imagine a world where we're all in boardrooms and we're discussing material weaknesses and significant deficiencies related to NIST controls? I mean, I would like to see that world. And I'm a guy who sits on public boards a lot. We're talking about MWs and SDs as it relates to accounting. That's important, don't get me wrong. Sarbanes-Oxley is an incredibly important piece of legislation. But can you imagine if we added cyber controls to SDs and MWs? We could elevate the hygiene of this world quickly as a result of that. And it wouldn't be that onerous to do. We figure it out. So literacy and controls, nothing to do with technology there, yep. just the mindset of change could change a lot of what we, we do. Anyway, one man's view. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's obviously people process technology, but um, you, know, you covered the people part. It's not just process, it's doctrine. Mm. We don't have strong doctrine in our space. I mean, just what I mean by that is you kind of, you can, you can say we don't have the right processes in place in a lot of areas, and that's part true, but you know, I don't think an internal control, internal controls approach to that is really getting very far. That gets to compliance, and that's not really leading to security outcomes. So, it's not quite that. I just, I think we don't often break down the IT change management problems that we have in the right way, and then like manage through them, um, showing scorecarding with data to the business unit that's lagging, and like using that, leveraging it throughout, breaking down these big complex um, zero trust architecture movements and the five pillars, right? You gotta break that down into specific business processes and then you know, IT projects and work breakout structures and like manage to that. And I don't see the discipline in our space, really anywhere, frankly. And I think that has to change. Like I think we have to get as disciplined as other uh, places and you, you, know, you can look at other industries that have gone through very similar challenges in the past and I think we just kind of need to get the doctrine there to fully sort of rationalize, hey, you know, we do know enough about this to say it's not the first time every time, right? Like, we keep treating it that way, I think, too much. It's, it's really, we, we have enough where we do know what the best practices are. We need to make sure everybody's trained on those and really understands how to do these, these things in a consistent right way, so. I'll just echo that during the fundamentals. Anybody who's in the cybersecurity profession knows what they need to go do. Making sure when you acquire a system that you actually can sustain it through the life cycle, just if it has nice bells and whistles, but you can't patch it or don't have access to it, maybe uh, rethink about what you are procured from. Uh, again, going back managed services, that's one of the advantages you have a service provider able to do a lot of those fundamentals for you. Yeah, it may cost you a subscription cost, but you know it's going to go get done. So 
how we deliver software as a service or cyber as a service, uh, I think is fundamentally changing given the fact we don't have enough people for everybody to be their own system, be their own patch manager, be their own administrator. I think as we collectively pool our resources to go do it collectively together better, making sure we're all, and we all agree, we all know what the same fight is, making, but making sure we can all execute that and, and, and don't uh, overextend yourselves to, to buy something or, or operate something that you can't you know you can't in a year or two from now. So I think uh, managing expectations and managing uh, what you can do and having realism set in is, is important in this field as well. Yeah. Excellent. Well, um, gentlemen, thank you. I thought that was a great way to set the stage for the conversations we're about to have later today uh, on the main stage and in our breakouts. Uh, please help me in thanking our panelists.